is everybody a lawyer here? Who's not a lawyer here? Okay. And who's not a gangster trying to take away somebody's land as cheaply and quickly as possible, trying to pay as little as possible? It's somebody's land, you want it. You don't want to pay it. You just want to take it away as efficiently as possible and make lots of money out of it. You don't really care about the rights too much. So here's a counterintuitive view on land acquisition. What's any project? What does it just pose? What does it bring together? Land, you have to construct a building, you have to get machines, you have to get finance, and you have to manage all these assets. But there's only one of these that is subject to coercive process. Imagine a situation where land was the only piece of the action which was not subject to coercive process. So you could simply tell a banker, I'm taking your money. So you simply take the bank's money and say, yeah, file a claim before some additional district judge. The machine manufacturers just take his machine. There are societies that have done that. So somewhere in all this, I feel that we urban elites have lost the plot on what we are doing and why we are doing it and how we need to view the whole thing. And, and the whole idea, when I think about this, the whole idea of a collector-approved rehabilitation scheme, payable subject to clear title, kickbacks, all these rules are designed to avoid payment or minimize it. These rules are not designed to be fair. So if, if you say we are a liberal democratic country, then let's practice what we preach. But we have a problem, and we are not going to fix it if we don't address the issue. Today, finally, somebody has turned around and said land acquisition is not a legal problem, it's a political problem. So the diabolical dramas of Didi in West Bengal bring home something fundamental to you, that there are people out there who you're treating in a certain way and it's not right. Let me test some fundamental assumptions that we make about the way in which we structure our society. All development is predicated on the acquisition of cheap land, not cheap finance. Oh no, where is LIBOR and where is the Indian rate? Not cheap machinery, let's tax it to death. Not cheap management, boy, you should see what the lawyers cost these days. Then what is development? What does it mean? And, and I want you to suspend judgment. I don't think that I'm, I'm making a pulpit speech on, from a leftist socialist platform, I'm not. I'm just talking about facts. What is development? Swanky houses, fancy cars, glitzy gizmos, high-speed highways, hotels, buffet spreads. That's what lies on the other side of taking somebody's land. So, so, so what do you tell yourself? I took this guy's land so I could have cheaper lipstick for my wife. It's absurd. And then what happens to these peasants? They live in some shanty town, unskilled laborer, get chicken gunia, his wife sweeps your floors, and you resent them for it after paying them peanuts. Let's take some scenarios. If I want to establish a factory, I just hire some hoods. I walk down to Bhonsi village, and I just kick everyone out. Am I a criminal or not? I am, right? Clearly. Took the law into his own hands, he did this Ranjeev Dubey. But if I bribe a politician who issues a notification and takes the land, is that a crime? You know, chances are pretty good, you will say, oh no, I am not a criminal because there's no choice. System is bad. I had to pay the politician, but he is a criminal. But what about the third one? I make a political contribution to a political party and they pass a law which legalizes this land acquisition on terms that are patently inequitable. What's that? That's due process. The World Bank estimates that every large dam displaces 13,000 people. 39 million people have been displaced since independence. The secretary to the Minister of Rural Development puts a figure at 40 million. I have the reference, I didn't, um, I didn't footnote this, but I can give it to you if you want it. This is a government figure. 
Then subsequent World Bank global case study of large dams, each dam displaced 31,000 people, not 13,000. Narbada, 70,000. You know, the Forest Act really upsets me. Traditionally, tribal people had heritable common rights to forests, and there was somebody talking about common land right now. It's not just common land in the sense that no one owns it. It's a common land that everybody has his lifestyle attached to it. So these, in traditional societies, all forest land, a lot of it was held in common. Then after the 1857 mutiny, the Crown designated India as a raw material source and potential market for manufacturers. The British Crown stepped in directly, said kick out the East India Company. Now we'll run this country, we're going to get rich. Through so services market, they needed forests for railways, shipbuilding, and fuel. So what do they do? First thing you have to do is you have to change your psychological orientation. Because the crimes you are committing can't be committed if you see the reality for what it is. So what do you do? You create, you create a legal change and you create a psychological orientation change. Now forest communities were certainly not common owners of these properties. What they were, they had a relationship with the property, which, could, which were issues which could be settled. So you reduce them by a law to claimants and you put a barbed wire around their property. Now if this was your DDA flat, what would you be thinking? Elites, urban elites in India have manipulated attitudes and laws for very self-serving ends. And this we need to recognize if you're going to frame a new law. Or we can do what our colleagues said here, don't have a law. Then it's a free for all, as happens. Remember the cowboys? What was the cowboys about? It is about the railroad needing the land. The cowboys walked in, killed everybody. Then along came Billy the Kid who said, wait a minute, you can't take my boss's land. Okay. Make him into a criminal, put a bounty on his head. That's Billy the Kid for you. Uttaranchal, 1893. All cultivated common lands, including village forest pastures and sacred groves, were declared state forests. A department was created which assumed total control over state forests and exercised sweeping powers to police them. It created a long list of things the forest dwellers could not do. There is no corresponding list of things the department cannot do. Department can do anything at school. So what happened? You had tribal revolts. Same thing happened across the country. The Bheel revolts are well known. Munda revolt is well known only because it killed a lot of government servants off. There was ruthless repression. Three forest acts, 65, 78, and 27. Each have increased the stranglehold on forests. So what you've done, if you think about it, is my lifestyle is criminalizing other people. It's happening even today. My need for iron or steel or some mineral criminalizes people in Jharkhand, Odisha. So I'm going to talk about Jharkhand, Odisha and the rest, Chhattisgarh. Rural communities have been hunting, gathering for two and a half thousand years. It's their lifestyle, it's their land, it's their, it's their story. I had no part of it. I have no right over it. First contact with civilization, the first historical contact is with Akbar. Akbar's government. But the horror begins in 1765, when the East India Company walks in there. So what do they do? They appoint zamindars, whose only job is to maximize revenue. So what do the zamindars do? They turn predatory, extorting high crop shares, sold them seeds at extortionist prices, usurious interest lanes, the rates, and they reduce peasants to bonded laborers. Now, when coal was discovered and iron in this area, the problem was out of control because whatever the British wanted to do to help these people was rendered impossible. The financial power was just too great in the hands of those who wanted to basically marginalize these people. Then you say, our government is dysfunctional. Yeah, this Chidambaram, I don't know what he's talking about. Where did this start? Because you set up laws that are absolutely unfair. What are protesters? Naxalites. Arrest them. So law has become an instrument of what? Repression, initiate, which has been unleashed to protect the lifestyle of people like you and I. Now, just one last slide. I don't want to make a huge political speech, although this is a completely political subject, obviously. Counterinsurgency vigilante. 
I mean, I don't know how much you know Salva Judum, but basically what you did was you hired a private army to beat up the people who lived on the land and hurt them, collectivize them, and put them into camps where all kinds of atrocities went on. Books have been written about this. They all have a flip card. It was no different from what the French did in Algeria, of which movies have been made as well. So between 2005 and 2008, Salva Judum, 12,000 child soldiers, burned 650 villages, rendered 3 lakh people homeless, and herded Naxalite sympathizers into camps where human rights abuse were rife. So what did the government do? You know, when people ask me what is the job of a government, I say there's only one job a government has. It has a monopoly on violence. I can't touch you, but the cop can come and beat me up. That's due process. If I touch you, I'm a criminal. That's the difference between me and government. It outsourced its monopoly on violence and gave it to Salva Judum, a private vigilante. And it abdicated its sovereign function, which is to police the people. Finally, the Supreme Court had to step in in this Nandini Sundar case. And they, and they said, this is illegal, you can't do it. Now, this is the context in which we have to talk about a fair acquisition law. Because when we see all of this, then we can see that there are many things we can't divorce from many others. Today, your land acquisition problem has occurred because you are not sensitive to all this, as a result of which there's a political backlash, as a, as a result of which people like Didi turn up and do the stuff they do, and the nano doesn't get made. It all follows from the attitude. 